Now here's the other side of things is it doesn't matter if I drive traffic if the listing doesn't convert well, right? So not only do you have to find the relevant customers, but you also have to have a product listing that has a high chance of conversion. So focusing on building that out and uh, really talking about the why. I see a lot of brands make mistakes because they try to stuff a lot of keywords into their product listing and think that's going to help them with SEL. What they care about is that when people come to the product listing themselves, that they purchase. You're listening to Ecomonics, a Debutify podcast, your resource for one-of-a-kind insights into the world of e-commerce and business in the modern age. This is Joseph. I'll be presenting a wealth of industry knowledge from interviews with successful business people and our own state-of-the-art research. Your time is valuable, so let's go. What's meaningful about my guest today, Daniel Tejada of Straight Up Growth, is that when I viewed some of his content elsewhere, he had attuned to the structure of that show to best serve that audience, and did so again with us today. Daniel gives us much needed insight into how important it is to be flexible and adaptive to each of your client's needs, how to handle high level pressure and optimize their return on investment when doing business on Amazon. Daniel Tejada, welcome to Ecomonics. It is good to have you here. How are you doing today? How are you feeling? Doing well in uh, sunny San Diego, so I can't complain. It's been a, a solid winter so far for us. Yeah, I, <laughs> I, you're not the first person uh, on the show who to pitch me on uh, San Diego. It's t- between that and Chiang Mai in Thailand, and uh, San Diego is a little bit closer. Uh, but for, for listeners who, uh, who don't uh, remember or know where I am, uh, I'm in occasionally sunny Toronto, Canada. It's so windy out right now that our, our panels outside are going... <laughs> San Diego is appealing almost by default. It's great to have you here. I was great. To, I was uh, glad to look into uh, a lot of what you're doing. Uh, this is going to be an Amazon focused episode. Um, so for those of you who uh, want to get a little bit of like some primer on Amazon, uh, I, one thing I've said prior is I do my best not to like retread familiar territory, um, which is quite legitimately going to get a little bit harder as time goes on because you know you get to like episode 300. I'm pretty sure I've asked the same question twice by that point. But check out the Steve Pope episode. It is one, it's a lot of what I'm going to talk about today is based on some of what I came to understand from that episode. And with that, I open up with our traditional economics question, Daniel, which is who you are and what do you do? Awesome. So my name is Daniel. I'm one of the founders here of Straight Up Growth. Uh, we're an Amazon agency that helps brands to scale and grow their businesses uh, on Amazon. Uh, just a little bit about my background. I've been fortunate enough to spend a little bit over $25 million in Amazon ads over the past couple of years and have sold a little over half a billion dollars worth of product on the Amazon channel. <laughs> okay. I, I I thought I had the metrics right because uh, I had written down here 15 million Amazon and yielded 500 million in sales. Uh, but that is out of date. So you have I, you have worked with quite a, a, a sum of, of money there. And there's there's two things that we can we can go we can go the, like the the technical route and because we definitely want to talk about you know how that money was uh, disseminated across the platform and then yielded such a high return and we'll get to that but mindset is a big deal in economics because one thing that we tend to talk about is if this within ourselves we don't have uh, we don't have it all together it doesn't matter if we succeed or not because it'll all just collapse anyways so. How have you um, responded to the pressure of working with that uh, quantity of money? Yeah, so uh, I think a big piece of that piece just comes down to understanding the the, the why I'm doing what I'm doing. Uh, you know, because the how ultimately you know, optimizing campaigns, keyword research, campaign structure; those are all things that can be taught. But really, to get to the point where you're really you know, comfortable spending large sum of sums of money. Um, or even making decisions that might seem uh, a little bit riskier, uh, just because you're not as familiar with it, you know, it can be hard. So really going and doing it uh, is key. But understanding the why you're taking the actions you take, really, in my experience, has been uh, a fundamental sort of piece of uh, our success on the Amazon channels. You know, we believe in the strategies that we're implementing because we've seen you know success across you know hundreds of different clients um, utilizing the same strategies, and so. It allows me to tell a client, you know, um, that's a good idea from a strategy, but maybe we should think about this, you know, because I just have that experience of actually doing it. Um, and I think that's a big piece. Sometimes people, you know, might know the know the how, but they've never really 
understand the why, and it makes it a lot harder to to make the right decisions as a result. Definitely, and um, you know, we we, we would want, to, I think, to uh, go through somewhat of a wrapping up process uh, rather than jumping in immediately and wanting to start having to start spending millions of dollars. It's you know, we, we, we learning um, how to how to handle that uh, with smaller quantities first. Then you get to those points, and then once you're there, you know, I, I I definitely want our listeners to be inspired and to always think, you know, you can get to this point as well. But what I did earlier before we uh, uh, met up is I just wanted to, in my mind, calibrate what is the current state of advertising on Amazon, and I just went into it. A very, very simple. I didn't dig uh, too deep into this because I tried to kind of like put myself in the mind of the customer for a second here. So I hop on Amazon and I go to like the gifts for everyone page and I scroll through and I probably scrolled through, I don't know, maybe like 60 or so images before I had to go to the next page. I didn't see an ad anywhere. So I, I, I'm in this position and I'm, and I expect some of my listeners also be in this position too, where we don't actually fully understand the relationship between advertising uh, on, uh, on Amazon in its current state. I'm trying to even remember some of what, you know, uh, I shared with, uh, Stephen Pope when I talked to him, I don't know. I, I guess I want to review more in depth, but anyways, so with advertising on Amazon, where is it primarily? Is it advertising going on within the platform? Is it using, uh, is it advertising externally say onto Google or Facebook to drive traffic to Amazon? Is it a mixture? Where, where are the ads right now? Yeah, that's a great question. And the thing is, it shifted. Right now, Amazon ads are everywhere. Uh, most people don't even realize they're, they're working with Amazon ads a lot of times. Uh, for context, when I started doing Amazon advertising in 2016, advertisements on Amazon were pretty obvious. It was like a sidebar. Um, and I don't know if you, were, if you used to shop on Amazon back then, because uh, they were a lot smaller. Uh, but you could really tell that you were clicking on an ad when they had those ads live. Now they have all sorts of different ad units. You know, even when you do any search on mobile or on desktop, you're actually everything you're seeing above the fold uh, is going to be an advertisement. So if I was, let's say, shopping for pre workout, you know, I'm going to work out and I search the term pre workout, I'll see a banner ad across the top, and then I'll see four sponsor product ads, then there's video ads, um, and you can even be targeted through Amazon's DS, uh, DSP platform, which is their display based uh, audience targeting. That can happen both on and off of Amazon. So Amazon has expanded beyond simply um, advertisements on the, the Amazon channel itself, and now they're actually off of Amazon as well. Um, and you can see that reflected in their their ad business itself. Like in 2016, Amazon did I think 550 million in, in ad revenue. Uh, in 2019, they did 11.4 billion dollars in ad revenue. So advertising got very competitive very very quickly. Um, you know, I was fortunate to be in there, you know, early on. Um, but it's crazy. You know, we've got people now, like I've got this girl on my team, her name's Katie. She's fresh out of school and she's managing, you know, very, very, very significant ad budgets already, you know, after only doing this for, for about four months or so. So it's still possible to get in. It's still something that is growing and it, it hasn't peaked at all. You know, Amazon's ad business, I tell people all the time, grows 50% every year because uh, they keep adding more units. They keep adding different um, uh, overlays you could put on top of your existing ad campaigns. So it's, it's pretty fun. It's you know, constantly uh, evolving right now. And I, I was, I was hoping to hear a little bit more about um, early on, like exactly like when you had started getting involved in Amazon and from your perspective, what were like some of the major shifts that you had seen to the point where you can, you can see if Amazon as a business as a whole is adjusting their strategy. Um, and just to, I want to add a little bit of spice to this because I think it's helpful to characterize what I'm looking for. I remember when I signed up for Facebook in, when I was in high school, it was like 15 years ago now. And at that time, Facebook was really just basically like a means to store memories and like comment on, you know, the semi-formal dance or stuff like that. And then it's evolved well past that. Now it's a whole ecosystem. There's a marketplace for it. There's advertising for it. There's messages, there's chats, there's video calls. It's, I mean, it's everything. It's, it's a whole like town square. Uh, so in that sense, th th that's the kind of transformation I'm wondering if you've seen from your perspective. Yeah. So I would definitely, I, I consider Amazon like Google or Facebook, you know, like 10 years ago. A lot of time, especially uh, I first started in 2016. I worked for this company called Quiver. Uh, Quiver was a really, really large kind of three P seller on Amazon, which means they purchase products from brands and then they uh, they go ahead and they sell it directly on uh, Amazon's platform. 
Um, but it used to be a lot different, right? Back then, it was a much smaller pie. Uh, even when we would reach out to brands and we would see uh, there was a, uh, something called retail arbitrage, where essentially folks would source products, like let's say they would find you know towels from uh, from Clorox. Uh, or paper towels, and then they would go, they would purchase them in store, they would sell them for a higher price point on Amazon. Um, that was possible because most of the brands didn't care about Amazon. It was too small of a, of a pie for them. Um, and so that made Amazon a lot easier, right? So back then, you know, we used to sell the number one dough whisk on Amazon's platform. Um, you literally just listed products. Um, you could do something called private labeling where you would source products in China and then you would, you know, essentially create a brand. Um, but advertising was really minimal, right? Didn't really make, uh, make up a big deal, you know, um, with a three or $4,000 ad spend a month, you, know, you can grow a brand a hundred percent a month back then. It was, it was really, really cheap cost per clicks below a dollar. Um, but even the platform itself, super antiquated, you didn't get a ton of reporting. Um, you had to hack together a lot of different things because Amazon, like even for how you gauge performance on Amazon, they made up their own metric, right? Instead of showing ROAS, which is your return on ad spend, uh, Amazon decided to create a metric called ACOS, which is literally just the inverse of, of ROAS, right? And so a ACOS is your average cost of sale. Um, they're literally the inverse of each other. About a year ago, Amazon decided to finally add ROAS to the reporting. Um, it was a simple math thing to do, so it's not a big deal, uh, but it just kind of shows like how Amazon has progressed over time into just adding more features that traditional marketers are looking for. Um, you know, they've added more and more ad units over time. Video advertisements, for example, did not exist for the first two years I, I advertise on Amazon. Um, they just rolled out probably about beginning of last year to all accounts um, before it was like beta. Um, so we've seen that kind of evolve. Uh, recently, they even added things like Firestick TV, um, where you can actually run ads to streaming devices um, to, to, you know, uh, to reach new customers as well. So that's something that I think will be big for, for 2021. Um, and it's something that I've seen just Amazon's constantly evolving because it is so early. Um, and so even on the ads piece, you know, we're very successful because we tried a lot of different things, right. Until we figured out, you know, what were winners, what were losers, uh, but we could definitely see Amazon follows a lot of other, ad platforms, you know, like a Facebook or like Google in the sense of you want to try things, you want to experiment. Some of those things are going to fail, but you should learn from those failures ultimately. And eventually you'll, you'll come to those winners, you know, if you, uh, you put in the time. Now, this is me uh, pontificating, but um, what you're speaking to, there's a parallel between um, some of the early returns you can get on Amazon as a platform with the same early returns that people can get on Facebook. So what would happen is people could uh, spend there's a small amount of money uh, to advertise dropshipping product on Facebook and they would get good returns. And then Facebook over time started to understand, you know, what are the limitations of this particular fulfillment method and the rules have gotten so strict, so much so that people are just breaking the rules by osmosis. Like I, my account is currently restricted just because I was in the vicinity of somebody else who made a mistake on his advertising. Uh, that's not, none of what I said is exa exaggeration. That's exactly what happened. And the thing that I'm pontificating about is if there's going to be opportunities for that early adoption position, because I don't think that I think the window is passed in Amazon, it may be something specific within Amazon, but not the platform as a whole. And the reason why I wonder that is just because you have these institutions now like big tech media, um, social media like Amazon. So while they've covered so much ground, I, I struggle to understand what would be like the next thing to try to get in on early um, that could also grow and become the size of something like Amazon. Yeah. So, I mean, now we see a lot of other marketplaces that people have jumped into, like the Targets or the Kroger's or Walmarts. Um, at least I see a lot of that. Um, and there's definitely some opportunity. I mean, some people get scrappy even using like something like eBay to sell products. Um, ultimately, I think where I have really followed and why I dove into Amazon so deeply is Amazon really took over product search, right? So uh, for context, last year, there was a study that came out, 70% of all online product searches started on Amazon. Um, for context, Google's market share of product search decreased from 23% last year to 17% of all prom uh, online product searches. So what Amazon's really become is the largest product search engine, you know, at least in the US. 
um, and ultimately kind of following that trend. So there's, it's still possible to do it in the U.S. It's just uh, you know some more aggressive strategies than you used to. Uh, but even looking at Amazon marketplaces that are abroad, for example, um, they're not nearly as competitive as the U.S. is yet. Right, but we know that Amazon is pretty relentless in what they're willing to do to become uh, or to be able to take over that much market share. Um, and so there are ways to still kind of follow what some people are doing in the US, kind of their strategies and techniques, and then bring them to other marketplaces where it's not necessarily as competitive. Um, I do think, you know, it'll be a little while before we see our next version of, of an Amazon. Um, I know there's new social apps. I don't know if you ever use a Clubhouse, uh, but that one's been pretty interesting. Uh, where you've been able, I've been able to see like the ability to, if you want to gain followers, you can do that one pretty easily because you just get on and you can just produce content at any given time. You just join a room and start talking until you figure that that one out. So um, things like TikTok, you know, has a lot of organic reach. LinkedIn has a lot of organic reach. So there's still ways you can um, you can make an impact. Uh, it's just Sometimes some certain channels you have to push a little harder than, than others. Like Facebook is tough to be, to be an expert now. Yeah, I, 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 uh, I'm amused when you said uh, Clubhouse because the, pre- the first time I was made aware of it was a uh, previous guest, Aaron Pearson. He said that I would love Clubhouse being, you know, with the voice, right? Being, being, uh, being someone who uh, I use my voice to survive, I would be a natural fit for it. At, at the moment, I have not been able to get on. Um, I think some of that has to do with the limitations of what, of iOS that you can use. Um, I think it's just for iPhone users. I don't think Samsung users or Android users have been able to get on it yet. Oh yes, yes it is. I do recommend it though. I think you it. Yeah, I'd, I'd love, I'd love to do it. I, I really would. Uh, there's something I there. There are numerous levels of irony about the whole like exclusivity thing it being called Clubhouse and oh you know we can't we can't let you in we can't let you into our Clubhouse and it's just I don't know it just I just go off and off on that. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I think you make a good point. They, they've grown very, very quickly, I think, with that exclusive launch model, right? Because I think it kind of made people want to get on and then everyone tries to get on as a result. Facebook did the same thing back in the day. I don't know if you remember that, but I was in New York in the East Coast, like around the college towns. So we got it before the West Coast did, but you had to get an invite when Facebook first launched back in the day too. Right. Yeah. Okay. The I, I just realized I've been marked. It was the, the whole uh, the lineup effect. Okay. All right. Uh, well, well played, Clubhouse. Well played. Uh, earlier on, we we talked about the. Uh, I, I, I'm still struggling to really quantify it, but you know, your the the output versus your returns, um, and the uh, how you managed to have such a uh, such great returns on that output. And I, I had asked you about the mindset, but I didn't ask you about more of the application of it. Now, I, you know, I, I, I don't know if uh, how much of like you're willing to reveal. Obviously, I, I imagine some of what you do, you would want to uh, keep to your keep to your clients. But I'm just going to ask it anyways, just so we can find out what we can find out. So what are some of the pillars or fundamentals of how you do what you do and how you're, you're able to get this uh, amazing uh, return on your ad spend? Yeah, great question. So I think the biggest um, biggest advantage or kind of uh, differentiator with our strategy uh, kind of speaks to your first question almost with mindset. And a big piece of that is we think of Amazon very much as a search engine, right? And I think that's a really big distinction um, in the sense of Amazon's got tremendous, tremendous volumes, um, both on your branded terms, but also on non-branded terms. And really, we focus a large portion of our spend on trying to acquire new to brand customers. Um, and ultimately, we do work with a lot of consumable uh, type of items as well. Uh, and so that bodes extremely well because what we want to do is move the brands that we work with away from just branded traffic. And so customers that already know them through some other channel, right? So if you already had a social following or you were doing a TV commercial or you know already had like influencers pushing traffic and even if that was to your own website there's 140 million prime subscribers in the US alone um, that even if you don't say the word Amazon they will still look for your product on Amazon right it's just ingrained with their shopping uh, behaviors and so that those sales are fine but those are customers that already know you right where we see a lot of success is looking at the value of the search terms that we're going after and what those customers actually offer. So if they're a new to brand customer, let's say I'm selling a protein bar, right? And 
I can go after my brand, you know, for someone who's looking for protein bar, or I can go after a term like protein bar that has 400,000 searches a month on Amazon, right? That's 400,000 potential new to brand buyers that I can access through my advertisements. The other thing that's changed over the past few years for Amazon is that they have shifted to be pay to play. So that means everything you search above the fold on both desktop as well as mobile is going to be a paid advertisement. So essentially what you're doing is you're just giving yourself the opportunity to showcase your product uh, you know, uh, to customers that don't already know you. Right. So I literally say, I help people find what they're looking for is essentially what my, my role is, you know, for the clients that I, that I, uh, you know, do, do engage with there. And so I think that's the first kind of best advice is, uh, visibility on the platform, since it is a search engine is key, right? Over 80% of sales on Amazon happen on page one of any search term. So if I do not already organically show up on that search term, it doesn't matter if I have the best product, the lowest price point, uh, you know, the best reviews, if people can't find you, they ultimately can't purchase from you. Uh, the other really big piece um, for us in the way we do ad strategy is the relationship your advertisements have with your actual organic rankings. And if you're unfamiliar, organic ranking is where you rank in a not paid placement, right? So where you're not you know, paying to have this ability. And so your ads actually have the ability on Amazon to directly positively impact that. Um, by actually, uh, if you're showing ads to relevant search terms, your conversion rates are high, Amazon will reward you with better and better organic placements um, as time goes on there. So that's sort of the second piece to the secret sauce where not only can we allow you to drive more new to brand buyers, but we can also help you increase your organic sales through your advertising. That's like something very unique to Amazon. That's something that a lot of uh, like you know, Google AdWords, for example, I could spend a million dollars on protein bar that won't help me rank any better for the term protein bar. It means I can drive a single sale there, but Amazon does not have that, right? Amazon, the ads do have direct impact on, on where you rank organically on that front. So that's the visibility piece, right? Now, here's the other side of things is it doesn't matter if I drive traffic, if the listing doesn't convert well, right? So not only do you have to find the relevant customers, but you also have to have a product listing that has a high chance of conversion. So focusing on building that out and uh, really talking about the why. I see a lot of brands make mistakes because they try to stuff a lot of keywords into their product listing and think that's going to help them with SEL. Ultimately, that doesn't really help. Amazon indexes you for seeing a term one time. They don't need to see it a million times in your listing. What they care about is that when people come to the product listing themselves, that they purchase. So talking about the why this product you know, is superior or has a better brand story or you know, has unique designs, that's really what's going to be advantageous. Um, and even taking it down to like your product photo level. Right? A lot of people I see do all this great work on writing out a nice title, strong bullet points, uh, but then their product photos are just like, if I, I was selling a water bottle, right? it would just be pictures of the back and the front and the bottom of the water bottle, but no one really cares what that looks like. right? What you should do is add text to your photos right, and actually talk about why this product is superior directly through photos. Um, and the real reason that's super important is a lot of people shop on mobile, right, on Amazon. And on mobile, your bullet points are pushed way below the fold. Your product photos are actually the most prominent thing for that listing. And so using that text will help improve your conversion rate. Um, you know, really simple, easy trick. But the better and better you can make your listing itself, the higher rate your ads will convert. And ultimately, the faster you're going to grow. Um, if your you know your conversion rate is high and your advertising efforts are uh, on point. So what you reminded me of is um, somewhat of a, a subversive tactic depending on the platform. So I'll use Twitter as an example. Twitter has a character limit. Uh, I used to be able to remember it back when it was like, I don't know, 128. Uh, and now, I don't know, it's like 200 or something like that. Whatever the point is, is that there is a way to subvert that, which is to just post an image and then within the image is actually just a huge wall of text and so all of a sudden somebody is now like over engaging on what is are supposed to be very digestible messages and, and it works and i've been on twitter for a number of years and i'm basically staying on until they're kicking me out for my views and basically people have they're, they're just doing this constantly and it seems it would it would think that like a, a platform like twitter or in, in amazon's case they would 
they would actually have some rulings against that just because, you know, there is, yes, okay, you're getting results out of it. And then, you know, they, you know, we all want the sales, we want the engagement, but it's also not really the point. Um, and so you end up in this meta game where now everyone is just going to use the images to then, or just start putting the text on the images. And actually, actually becomes a standard now, where now if, if you're not putting text in the images, that actually now causes a decay rate, where now they're just not keeping up with the other competition. So uh, I, 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 I'm being a little bit critical there. I do think it's a, it's, a, it's a great idea. And so the question that I want to ask you is, you know, what limits do you put on the text? And then to relate to uh, my, my point about that is actually, have you seen any feedback, uh, even from Amazon directly or saying, okay, you know, this, it's gone to the point now where there's more text than image on this. So, you know, uh, back it up a bit there. Yeah, great question. So I would agree. This is something you see on Amazon a lot is someone comes up with an idea and then everyone else in their category starts to do it because it's essentially successful. And then essentially Amazon sort of polices it, but I think they do kind of wait for the data to kick in to really make a decision on if they make the change or if they crack down on it or not. Um, and so in this case, like with text to photos um, and like, so you could think of it visually, imagine it's still a very rich image, but what you're doing is you're adding like little like blocks of text, so almost like an infographic, um, if that makes sense, essentially two photos. Um, and so it still provides a, a good customer experience. And really, Amazon is very customer focused. So at the end of the day, it's the same reason your ads have impact on organic rankings. If they find customers that are converting at a high rate to specific search terms or specific items are, um, and they're seeing happy customers and sales volume is high, Amazon just wants to provide the most relevant search result for each customer, the ones that have the highest likelihood of sales. And so adding something like this product photo with some text starts to increase that, Amazon will reward that. They won't necessarily fight that piece. Um, I think there are certain instances, like and I'm thinking just Google SEO, old days, uh, You know, one of the hacks people would do is uh, Google would literally count the number of times you would have a, a search term right on your website or on a web page for ranking. And so people could figured out that they could add text, you know, to their, uh, to their webpage and then they would just make the text and the background color exactly the same. So it looked like a black screen, but in actuality it would say pizza's near me, pizza near me. Right. And so now you rank really well, but it doesn't necessarily deliver a good customer experience. And so that's where Google would say, actually, this is not going to count as duplicate content and we're going to negatively impact these, um, these, these sort of, uh, this sort of behavior. So I think Amazon does that a lot. Uh, we've seen that do that them do that with things like reviews so back in the day uh there were these like flash sale sites you could use to generate a lot of reviews where you would basically put your items on there for 90 percent off discount people would buy it because they're paying almost nothing for the item and then you'd get a ton of reviews overnight uh, and they'd all be five star the problem is those kind of items would be really successful and then they would get a lot of returns because they weren't always good products um, and so amazon cut that out you know in like 2017 um, so they do I would, would say like um, they definitely do analyze um, their sort of back and forth. And then I think based on how people respond is ultimately how they make decisions on if they need to crack down or not. That, I, I find that pretty funny too, the 90% off and all these five-star reviews. If you, if you can recall maybe like some of the products in specific, I'm just curious about that. Otherwise, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll shift gears. Um, that, that, that we're using the 90% off. Yeah. yeah I'm just wondering like what products. Oh well, yeah. I mean, this was years ago, but like you literally, uh, I think it was called like jump shout or, or jump send. I can't remember one of them, but they were all a rebate key. I think it was another one, but essentially it was like, uh, they, they would just create these huge email lists. And so you would list your product, you give them a certain number of units you can make available. And then they would just shoot a blast off like email blast in the morning. And you you could put a hundred items up there for review, and they'd all be sold out in you know a couple hours. Uh, but yeah, usually like a couple hours, then you get all your reviews on there. Uh, but Amazon did crack down on those. So one of the things that we were touching on is the relationship between a seller externally versus internally. So if somebody has a prior profile, they're known even on radio, which is something else I want to ask you about, but we'll, we'll get to that. Um, and one of the conver one of the things that really stuck out to me when I talked to uh, my Amazon guy, Steve Pope, is that he had pointed to me that of all the things that are bought from Amazon that are in my room right now, I don't remember the brands for them at all. 
I've had about six months to figure out what brand my mattress is, and I still don't know or frankly don't care. Uh, and also, to be honest, I'm actually not really happy with it. My quality of sleep has been deteriorating, so I got to get another one. But all of that, all of that said, well, you know, it's just we moved in the apartment. You just something, something to avoid sleeping on the floor. So with all of that said, I, I would like to hear from your perspective the re- the relationship between these two and how much have you seen in the, any of your clients being able to pull this off or have you been able to uh, instruct them on how to raise brand awareness within Amazon? Great question. So on Amazon, you will see, and you'll hear this a lot, like, oh, Amazon's a race to the bottom. Um, and it can be in certain cases. If you're not building a brand and you're really selling a product, so to me, it's almost more of a a commodity at that point, um, then you really are competing for that single sale. Um, And that also, just because Amazon's gotten a lot more competitive, makes things a little bit more um, tricky for growth right? in the long term. It makes it a lot harder uh, since you don't have a good AOV. Um, Where I find a lot of success is with the types of brands that we work with is they are really more focused on being a brand. Um, And we do sort of brand building and we have a suite of products that tends to be related to the category. So whether it's beauty and I'm a skincare brand and I've got you know multiple skincare products or pet and I've got multiple toys that I'm, I'm running there. Um, but part of it comes down to the listing itself, right? You can usually tell when someone's selling more of a commodity item because it's really just talks about a couple short bullet points on what the product is. That's it. You're making a decision on if you need this ruler. Let's just say I was selling a ruler, right? It's like, oh, it's got 12 inches, whatever it is. Um, but you're not sitting there looking up the brand next time you need a protractor, right? Unless they really did a really good job of speaking through like, this is Dan's ruler company, right? Like we um, are building, uh, you know, we're doing, uh, we're donating to uh, help build schools in Africa, right? And our tools go towards, you know, not just our, our pockets, right? But they're going towards um, the greater good, right? That's just small off the cuff example, right? But that's how you're building more of a brand. Uh, if you've got photos that are just pictures of your product or you have photos that are pictures of your product, but also tell a brand story, right? And maybe even cross promote to other items you sell. Um, then there's things as simple as um, like product inserts. You can try and get that customer to come back, you know, and, and chat with you again. Um, or, you know, something as like, I've got a client in the keto space uh, where we grow really, really quickly in our lowest price point item is almost a loss leader to get them to get to our higher price point items. And one of the things we do is we've got you know QR code on our packaging, product insert as soon as they go in, we get them to essentially download this um, really, really helpful content and guide of, around keto and uh, uh, a couple different uh, facets there. And we've collected you know 4,000 email addresses over the past three months, um, which we can then you know use to remarket um, towards higher price point items. And when we launch new products, we now have a, a faucet to launch new products with and things like that. I looked into some of the case studies that you had put out uh, publicly uh, on your website, uh, straightupgrowth.com. And I hesitated for a second there because I realized there's actually a lot of websites now that are like .io and I forgot if you're a .com or not, but <laughs> straight up growth, that part I got. And uh, I, and I pointed out to, well, it was two out of the three, but I, what I saw and what I really appreciated is that you and you're doing it right now, by the way, because I've listened to some of the other interviews and as try as hard as I can to fully understand some of the stuff does go over my head. And you shifted gears for this conversation, knowing what uh, what we're going for with this kind of content. And so um, one of the one of the three was a pro support. And, you know, your team were highly involved in guiding the company. Walk, you walk them through the basics of advertising, staying in constant communication. And this is something that's really important. And, and I've hammered this point numerous times throughout the, the show in one way or another, where, you know, if you get somebody who say like tries to do something manually, they understand the value of it, then they get somebody to automate it for them. But if they don't do it manually, but they recognize the importance, the next best thing is what you're doing, which is to show them step by step. You know, walk him through um, some of the basics. So I was wondering if you're willing to expand on maybe some of the examples specifically of some of what you had to walk um, that company through or how you were able to kind of like climatize them or acclimate them to advertising on Amazon. Yeah, great question. So with this client, you know, they had um, had to make some changes to just some internal things. And so, you know, they had a new person basically come on board to manage Amazon at the same time I was, you know, basically going to be helping not just with the actual growth side, but almost educating them on 
how what what metrics they should pay attention to, what's important, how long is it going to take, um, and it's a beast. You know, there's Amazon's definitely got its uh, its bugs that you have to work through. Um, but one of the bigger pieces, I think, um, is that a lot of times with especially with advertising, like certain Amazon as a whole makes sense, but then you get into the ads, and especially if you've never done it before, um, it can be confusing, right? When you're you, you hear some of these terms or like even the terminology like ACOS or CPC or CPM, right? That might sound like gibberish and it's, that's okay. Right? It's something that can be learned. Um, and so I think one of the big things with this client is, um, you know, she worked really hard at, on the learning side of things, but we were educating, but constantly educating, right? It's not something that you're going to remember uh, overnight, right? It's not something you can just like study for for a test. There's certain fundamental things that you just have to, drill down and you know you'll ask questions about today you might ask the same question a week from now or three weeks from now but that's okay eventually there is a point where it just makes sense Um, and i think another part of it is seeing it happen so if you have a partner um, or you hire someone internally that at least has some of that uh, education or experience behind it they can help walk you through and just help continue to make you feel confident that you are going down the right path because uh, ultimately, sometimes it could be scary, especially if you're launching like a competitive category. Uh, you know, in, uh, in Amazon in the US, you're brand new. You know, it's going to take a while to grow. To grow. Um, but as long as you have a you know, strong game plan, you've set targets for yourself, you're meeting those targets, or you're finding out why you're not meeting those targets and working to get there, you know, you should be able to uh, see success on the platform. And, you know, for a client like that, you know, we watched our sales grow. Know, like over a hundred percent year over year last year. Um, you know, and this is someone who knew absolutely nothing about Amazon and we're on track to grow another hundred percent year over year uh, at our current rate, which has been pretty, uh, pretty cool. Awesome. I, I, I did, by the way, I did hear the, uh, the sounds go on in the background. I'm only pointing that out because at first <laughs> I thought you have a neighbor who has a theremin because like at first I don't, <laughs> I don't understand what it is. And I just see like, whoa, wah, 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 wah. I'm like, oh, man, I haven't heard a theremin in years and I still haven't. Okay. <laughs> Uh, yeah, and this ties into there's two other things that I wanted to tie into this little section here. I, the other thing that I wanted to ask you as well is when I'm looking at the contact form and it says, you know, when you're ready to grow your brand on Amazon to reach out. And what I wanted to ask, and you kind of answered it, but I'll say it anyways, just in case we can add any more color to it, which is, you know, what would you, what would you characterize as an ideal state of readiness? Because you do have people who really don't know the fundamentals, they don't know the first steps. So, you know, if there's anything you'd like to see in the uh, uh in potential clients and how you audit them which also audit is a different question altogether but we'll get to that yeah so uh you know we do these audits for for clients um before we engage with them for clients that would qualify for us to do like a free audit essentially we're looking for clients that um either already are doing some sales on, on amazon itself um doesn't have to be huge we do take clients that uh can be smaller as long as there's kind of a path to growth uh, or some, uh, that we see um, there, uh, other types of clients, uh, we usually don't take like net new unless you have some sort of like off Amazon channel. So if you had a social channel or you had some sales already at .com, uh, you know, retail channel, and you really need to understand how to, how to get where to even get started on Amazon, we can definitely help facilitate that. Um, and can do sort of this category analysis where we can help. Uh, point you in the right direction um, you, uh, on that front, and then really understanding your goals. Um, so, if you're doing more retail arbitrage and you're purchasing products and reselling them, um, our service is probably not as worth it for you because there's the, there's probably solutions out there that are a little bit cheaper uh, that would make sense if you're doing retail arbitrage. Uh, but if you have your own brand, your own product, um, and you're doing some sales, you know we're happy to have the conversation. Uh, our agency is pretty transparent in the sense of, you know, if we can't engage with you right now, we'll give you the, this is what I would work towards the next 30, 60 days. And then, you know, we, we want to pick up the conversation later on. So that way we work together when we know we can actually make an impact on your, uh, your account. I, I guess it's, it's client specific, but what would be some of the advice that you give to people before they can come back? Yeah. So I would say, you know, one, uh, understand your goals. Um, you know, if, are you selling a single product? Or are you trying to, to build a brand out? Um, you know, are you looking to grow slowly? Or are you looking to be the number one, uh, you know, in your space quickly? Because those are two different goals and you're going to have a, two completely different strategies from that. Um, and part of it is it doesn't hurt to talk to folks or brands or agencies as well, um, even if you're not engaging with them right away, just to get some input, you know, because they do have a lot of experience. And, uh, you know, I spoke with this 
uh, we work with this beauty brand now. Uh, and when I had spoken to them, you know, they had spoken to like five other agencies that were like, no, you're not ready for Amazon yet. Um, or to, to really advertise, we can only spend like $4,000 a month. Uh, you know, they were only doing like 10 K a month. Like this past month, they did $60,000 you know, in revenue. We've been working with them for, for six months. Um, cause we did see a path to, to market there. So you don't have to be afraid of Amazon. Um, uh, you know, I will say certain categories are super competitive. Um, and so definitely talking to some experts, I would say is something that is, uh, worth doing, especially, uh, you know, even if you have a, a decent business and, uh, it's going well and you feel like you've plateaued, um, I'd be surprised if you actually plateaued on the Amazon cause like you should be able to grow month over month for a long, long time on that platform. Um, at least in my, in my personal experience. Yeah. I mean that, 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 that checks. Uh, Amazon is a, a rather large, uh, component of the marketplace. So I, yeah, I, I, I definitely see the logic there. The other case study that I wanted to uh, touch in on, um, and this is specifically about sales targets. So for, it was the, uh, the bully bone company, the number one dog chew toy in Walmart, but they were having some challenging sales targets and. I, I, I had done sales for a number of years, so I've always been the recipient of sales targets, like you know how much I have to sell on the day or how much we're looking to sell on the month. And I can kind of get a grasp on the importance of these you know, for expansion or keeping the lights on. So how have you seen companies set up you know, practical, actionable sales targets? A couple things to keep in mind. One is you know, launching new products, expanding the product selection, things like that. That's one way you can grow your revenue. Um, and the other one is in relations to your ad spend. So what, especially once you really have a strong handle on what your marketing spend can help accomplish um, and what your goals are. Uh, you know, this brand was running at probably a third of that sort of 100K target on what they were looking for. You know, 100K was more like a moonshot for them. Um, but since we had actually a decent amount of data for their advertising efforts, we had a decent amount of data on what their sales growth uh, trends had looked like. Using that info, we could actually build out what we potentially thought the volume looked like and what the path was to 100k, and so uh, it meant you know increasing ad spend um, pretty decently, you know, compared to what they were looking at before. Uh, but they've been you know really really happy because we were able to hit that target um, and have continued to see growth uh, ever since uh, without you know necessarily robbing the bank uh, or uh, you know to to afford it. Right? It was actually more achievable than than expected, uh, but it's just something that they didn't uh, really even potentially consider from a forecasting perspective. So everyone does forecast in their own way, um, but it is important to at least set them. And even if you don't hit them, uh, it's what do you learn from that, right? So there's plenty you can learn from not hitting your sales targets too. Um, it almost makes you sometimes stretch to like, oh shoot, we're below our sales target. What do we need to do? Maybe we'll add some promotions. Maybe we'll add a little bit extra spend. Maybe we're going to revamp our ad campaigns. Um, so there's going to be a lot of different options um, there, but I do think having those um, those sales targets almost becomes uh, a uh, almost forces you to 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 reach them. Okay, so this is this is going to be a fun one, and this is the one that I had uh, primed you on before we started recording. So uh, so for listeners, usually what I do is uh, I'll put some time in just to check out some of the other content that our guests have been on. The more I can uh, be ready for them, the better. And I found out that our guest Daniel is a big, huge fan of The Office. Um, I myself, I, I love the series. I, I watched every episode, um, but I don't like routinely go back and, uh, and watch reruns. Although there was a week where the YouTube algorithm was just like feeding me Office clips, a clip after clip. <laughs> after clip. Uh, so there, so, so, so it does happen. This is a hypothetical. Let's say Dunder Mifflin reaches out to you and they want to modernize their business because uh, Lord knows they can use the help. Uh, the last guy they got to do it uh, wasn't so hot. Uh, how would you onboard them? And so they, they can start selling their paper products on Amazon. It's a great question. Um, and it's actually one that we do quite often. So for me, if you're dealing with Michael Scott, who's someone who probably knows nothing about Amazon, right? Which is very common with the types of, of clients that we work with, but they know their product, you know, they know their market. Um, so a few things is one is setting expectations, right? To understand that, yes, you may be, the biggest supplier in retail, but that doesn't mean that that is going to uh, be replicated instantly on Amazon itself, right? This is sort of the path to market. And so we'll do a category analysis so they understand what the, the size of the prize looks like, but also what it's going to take to get them to be a major contender in that platform. Um, then we work with them to understand, you know, how they're going to sell on Amazon, whether it's vendor central or seller central, 
um, understand their profitability on margin on Amazon because that is also a mistake people make is they learn how to sell the products, but they're not actually making money uh, when they're selling it on Amazon. So that's something that I push for clients. Um, and then the biggest piece I'll do very frequently is, you know, kind of follow an 80, 20 rule, right? So, uh, 80% of your revenue is going to come from 20% of your catalog. So if you've got a massive, massive catalog, uh, you know, you need to probably refine that to figure out what the Amazon kind of repertoire of products should be. Um, and then from there, you'll, you'll nail down your marketing budget. Um, I'll, if everything checks out between the client and what we're working on, then we set you up and we can launch you and, and get things moving. Uh, on the platform there. Uh, but then, yeah, obviously dealing with Michael Scott would be uh, its own beast, but I've dealt with many variations of him before. So it's all good. Fair enough. I, I It's been a while since I've seen it, but I was just trying to remember, like, does Mike, Michael Scott knows how to use the internet at least, right? Like, I'm pretty sure he, he, he got that far, but I'm not. Barely. He couldn't do folders on his computer. So... Right, which yeah. wouldn't be the whole yeah. client where I've, I've seen that before. So, well, I, I just have to say that that's just something that I that I really respected about your your business when I was just you know uh, doing uh, doing my thing. Uh, it's just because when you're looking for people to work with, uh, the quote is, you know, we help good people grow online businesses we believe in, and you know, you, you we we've definitely talked about you know these are people who want to succeed, you know, and they're ready and they believe in their product and 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 they want to make their way into the Amazon market. So, um. I, I just wanted to to know that I really appreciated that gem there because it helps to um, remind everybody that regardless of the scale that they're working at currently is that, you know, you still have to be good people because um, you want to be someone that you can actually like tolerate and, and, and be happy to work with day after day, as well as, you know, for, for your own company's reputation too. And, you know, the, the more positive people you work with, the more they're going to reflect in their own, in their feedback and their testimonials for it. It's why I found the, the, um, uh, the case studies that I did and continues, it was a positive cycle. It reflected, you know, what you guys are about. Yeah, no, I think uh, at the end of the day, if you can't have a, a positive relationship, uh, you know, it's just not, it's not worth it. It's not worth the client's time. It's not worth, uh, it's worth our time. And like you said, you work a lot better when, when you mesh well. So I think even when you're choosing your partner, that's something to, to consider. And even in how you guys treat your partner sometimes too, you know, because I'm not going to say we have, we've definitely turned down business that, would have been lucrative, but because it just wasn't the right people for us. Yeah. So I know I don't have you for too much time uh, more. So I did have a couple of other things I wanted. To, I was just curious about. Uh, so I'll run through these and then I'll uh, get you an Addy. I was looking at your your different services and you have them uh, split into three groups. Um, the second of the three groups is like additional services. And uh, there was advertising and broadcast TV and terrestrial radio. You mentioned earlier about being able to say like, promote yourselves on Amazon Prime because they they have a, a an install base of over 100 million subscribers. So I, I I was just wondering about in in the way where you take something very classical like a Dunder Mifflin and we apply it to something uh, contemporary like Amazon is how how much of what you do is the opposite where you're taking something contemporary and you're uh, finding classical routes to uh, promote them through broadcast TV and terrestrial radio? This is a great question. It's for us really client by client basis. Um, not everyone needs it, but when you really understand the thing with you that I think is most important with Amazon is that it's not in place of your other strategies, right? It works, it should work in conjunction and one channel should be able to grow the other uh, there. So like I worked with one, worked with one brand, let's just, uh, you know, in the pet space that does, subscription pet boxes on their .com, right? Huge brand. They were doing like 50 million a year on their .com. They were doing about $12,000 a month, you know, on, on Amazon there. Uh, but they decided they wanted to be the number one, you know, dog bit on Amazon. Um, they're selling a higher price point item, no distinguishing features, no reviews um, in a space that's hyper, hyper competitive. It was a very tough kind of pill to swallow initially. Uh, but we actually leveraged some off Amazon traffic that they traditionally leveraged for .com repurposed it for the means of building Amazon's relevancy and audience, you know, within 12 months, we're doing a million dollars a month um, on Amazon from $12,000 a month, right? And it's just by taking a small piece of that other marketing channel that they normally wouldn't leverage, but it paid off in their benefit because their .com grew from 50 million to 250 million during that same time frame, right? And it's just repurposing existing tool that already works. Not every client needs that. Um, but there are instances that, that they do it. So that's where just getting creative, you know, it doesn't always have to be all Amazon, right? You can still leverage traditional advertising mediums 
for Amazon specifically, as long as you understand your goals and your intentions behind it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, I've taken up the, the position that while something like radio, it might die, it will just be reborn and take on a new shape. And also, I, I think another thing too about uh, these uh, previous mediums is that we tend to look at them as things that are you know, decaying or dying or on the decline. Whereas I tend to see as just the market expands. And if they can continue to expand along with that market, great, but often they don't. And so they continue to hold on to whatever I share of the market that they have. So, you know, just your radio still has a, a significant uh, a share of the market because there are still people who depend on it. Absolutely. And sometimes it's just like the medium doesn't die. I think it transforms. It's the people that really understand how to transform it. Like look at newspaper, right? Newspaper might be dead on, might, might not be, you might not be holding a newspaper right now, but there's an app on your phone called the news app, I guarantee, or Google News that you can use to read news, right? every day and they're still so uh you know writing for it so it's the it's the folks that the mediums that adapt for the adaption and uh, or adaptation of how consumers purchase that really see the most success two more questions uh because i know uh your your, your time is a, is a ticking here um so one of them is i listened through your interview on uh, buy box experts and uh, one of the topics you guys talked about was like some external software such as like helium 10 and jungle scout i myself i know i've talked to uh steve about uh, helium 10 for a bit but um, would you be willing to run our listeners who maybe aren't familiar with these uh, softwares? Like, what are some ones that we can look into just to help support our Amazon? Yeah, Helium Ten is one of the most popular. Helium Ten is one of the more popular ones. Uh, it's good for product research. It's also good for tracking uh, a lot of different metrics, like once you're actually selling. So you can track things like organic rankings. You can get a lot of data on keyword volumes, how competitive those keywords are. Uh, you can track like buy boxes, changes in price points. Um, so think about it as sort of a supplement for holding all this data that, or getting extra data uh, from Amazon that you don't get right through their standard reports. Um, and then Jungle Scout is similar where I really like uh, Jungle Scout. Usually it's like Jungle Scout or Helium 10. Uh, they kind of, it's usually one or the other. Uh, some people use both. I use Jungle Scout a lot for like um, sales volumes and estimates. Um, for scraping different categories and just understanding how many reviews I need and what my price points are looking like and things like that can be really powerful. Um, it's another tool that I really recommend called Keepa. It's K-E-E-P-A. Um, really great tool for tracking uh, sales ranks, uh, reviews, um, as well as like buy box and price points too. It's pretty inexpensive. So I highly recommend that, that tool as well. All right. Um, so... Well, technically, the rasp of question, I tend to not count that one as a question. So I technically just have two more, but one more figuratively speaking. Um, just one thing I, I'm, I'm always curious about, which is like if what you were, say, up to before the e-commerce uh, space took over. Some people, they get into e-commerce right away. Some people, they tend to maybe have like a, they have a different field first. Yeah, so I got into e-commerce almost right after school. Um, I, I did start in SEO first, um, for, which was more B2B SEO. So it did like... SEO for like chiropractors and dentists and uh, optometrists. Um, and then I, I ran some AdWords stuff on my own, like from there. And then Quiver 2016. I mean, I graduated in 2015, so I really hit Amazon almost right after school. All right. Uh, that was everything. I just said uh, that was the last one that I had. So, uh, Daniel, thank you. This has been jam packed of info. And it's been uh, a lot of help. And I, I, I might want to use like office metaphors more often because I think they really help to kind of like, you know, uh, characterize in our minds. So uh, the last thing I got to get you to do is if you have any final parting words, just in case any last things you want to share with our audience, words of wisdom, stuff like that, feel free. And then let people know how they can get in touch with you. Awesome. So uh, words of wisdom, uh, anyone can teach themselves anything when it comes to digital. Um, there I taught myself how to do AdWords, you know, I taught myself how to do Amazon, I've hired lots of people at this point, um, and almost all of them have zero advertising background or even zero digital marketing background sometimes. Um, so don't feel like it is impossible to learn. Someone who firsthand uh, knows that would be my, my biggest input. You just can't be a bit afraid to fail. It's like what you learn from your failures that give you the, the best results. Uh, and then to reach out to us, you can uh, find us on straightupgrowth.com. You can also shoot me an email at dt at straightupgrowth.com uh, or find me on LinkedIn, Daniel Tejada, T-J-A-D-A. 
Well, this has been a, a great hour. Again, thank you for your time, listeners. Thank all of you as well for being a part of this. Uh, you all know what to do from this point on. So take care and we will check in soon. Thanks for listening. You might have found this show on many number of platforms. Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play, Stitcher, or right here on Debutify. Whatever the case, if you enjoy this content and want to help us thrive, please take a few moments to leave a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you think is best. We also want to hear from you, so whether you think you'd be a good guest or want to weigh in on anything related to our show, you can email podcast at debutify.com or connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. Finally, this podcast is created by the passionate team at Debutify. If you're ready to take the plunge into e-commerce or are looking to up your game, head over to debutify.com and see how it can change your life and the lives of many through what you do next.